Hey guys, I just wanted to do a quick clarification video um, about some of the things I've said in my recent videos that I think some people have taken out of context um, by reading some of their comments. Um, guys, when I say in my videos that Jesus's parables were directed by and large at the unbelieving nation of Israel and that we need to understand his parables in that context, I'm not saying that there's no application um, for his parables in our lives today. I'm not saying that because Jesus in the direct context was referring to unbelieving Israel, that therefore his words are irrelevant, that um, we shouldn't read them, or that there's no application at all um, for the church today. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you want to come to the proper understanding of what Jesus is getting at, the root of his message in those parables, you need to read them and understand them in their direct context if you want to be able to properly apply them at all, right? Um, and I want to give you a couple examples of that. Um, for example, Jesus' parable of the weed and the tares, all right? Um, scripture is clear that in Jesus' direct context in his three-and-a-half-year ministry, the antagonists of Jesus' earthly ministry were the unbelieving Jews, okay? It's them that he identifies as the children of Satan. They are the wicked generation that he had come to. Um, it's in the direct cultural context, the unbelieving Jews that he is identifying as the tares in that parable, okay? They are the ones that Jesus is linking to being children of the devil, all right? He talks about this, John chapter 8, 11, 12, um, those are the ones in the direct context that he's identifying as the tares in that parable. That's not to say, guys, that there are no tares today in the Christian church. It's to say that if you want to understand who those tares are, you need to understand who Jesus was speaking to when he identified them. Remember, guys, that Jesus came to a wicked generation of his time. That wicked generation that he came to were the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he's identifying them as the ministers of Satan, all right? The children of the devil, as he calls them, all right? And the reason they were children of the devil was because they should have been the ones to recognize his coming. Of all people, they had the Torah, the prophecies, um, they had all of the prophets, the law. They are the ones that should have recognized his coming, but they couldn't see because they were blinded. Um, and they were religious. They were trying to clean the outside of the cup, but inside they were dead. They were trusting in their own righteousness and the law of Moses, rejecting the Messiah, okay? And for this reason, he calls them children of the devil. They were clinging to their lineage to Abraham, trying to clean that outside of the cup, but because they were rejecting him and trying to murder him, he calls them children of the devil. Now, that's not to say that today in the church, there are not tares, okay? Because Jesus and Paul tell us that as the ages go on, that same Antichrist spirit that existed within the unbelieving Jews would infiltrate the church and teach doctrines of devils, okay? Paul is clear about this. Jesus is clear about this, that that same Antichrist spirit that rejected Christ and hated Christ will infiltrate the church throughout church history and also teach doctrines of devils, very, very similar to what you see in Judaism, which is why, guys, if you look at things like, for example, the Catholic Church or certain denominations of Christianity, they have a lot of similarities with Judaism. In fact, they're rebranded Judaism in a lot of ways. Just look at some of the ritual practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, a lot of their practices, their doctrines, the things that they do, they mimic a lot of the things that the Jews do. Um, and so it's a kind of rebranded Judaism, right? It's a rebranded religious system. And so, yes, I believe there are still tares in the church today, but if you, and, and that that parable applies to, to individuals today, right? Um, but if you want to understand who those people are, you have to understand who Jesus was directly speaking to in that parable, speaking to and about in that parable, all right? Once you have a proper understanding of the context, then you can apply the context properly um, in our lives today, in our walk today. Um, so I want to be clear about this, guys. I'm not saying that because Jesus was directly 
speaking to the Jews in many of his parables, that that means there's no application at all today, all right? Another good example of that is in Matthew chapter 7. In the direct context, Jesus is clearly referring to the unbelieving Jews there, okay? He, he identifies who he's talking about throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus speaking to the religious leaders who were confident in their own righteousness by the law and telling them, you have not kept the law on your best day. You got to understand that, the, that he was speaking to religious people who were confident that they were okay with God because of the law of Moses. They were confident in their own righteousness. So when Jesus came and says to them, no, you're not, you're condemned, you need a spiritual savior, they said, no, we don't, we have Moses, right? And so Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was all about taking the law and elevating it to its true standard so that the religious could understand that there was no hope for them under the law of Moses for them to be able to be made right with God. So he says to them, the law says... Do not commit adultery. I tell you that if you have ever even looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her. He's taking the law and showing religious men what God's true standard is so that they're crushed under the weight of it and they reach out for grace. Okay, that's the purpose of the law. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount was using the law lawfully, as Paul says. All right. And so those are the people that he was speaking to. And at the time of Christ, there was no Christian church. There were no Christians at that period of time. This was early in Jesus's ministry in Matthew chapter seven, all right? The sheep, the wolf in sheepskin that he's referring to are the religious leaders of Israel. They are the ones that supposedly knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the ones that everyone of that time thought were righteous, right? They were the ones that everybody looked to to learn about the things of God. They thought the Pharisees and the, and the, and the Sadducees and the, you know, the religious Jews, those were the creme de la creme, right? This is why Jesus says about them that they're wolves in sheepskin. On the outside, they look religious, but they don't serve God. They profess him with their lips, but in their hearts, they're far from him. This is why Jesus identifies those people as whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but dead on the inside. That He says they try to clean the outside of the cup, but inside they're filthy. Read Matthew chapter 23. Ask who he's talking about in that entire chapter, guys. The people that he's speaking about in Matthew chapter 7 that are going to come to the Lord on the, day of, on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these things in your name? The direct context there that he's referring to, the tree that produces bad fruit in Matthew chapter 7 is the same fig tree, the barren fig tree that he's talking about in Luke chapter 13, that he's talking about in um, Isaiah chapter 5 and elsewhere in Isaiah. All right. It's, he's referring to this tree that produces bad fruit because he's speaking about a very specific tree, the same barren fig tree that he's been speaking about, that Isaiah speaks about. All right. The unbelieving nation of Israel that had everybody fooled into thinking that they were God's representatives but they were liars. They prophesied lies in his name, all right? And they rejected the Messiah because they were ruled over by the Antichrist spirit. They were children of the devil, okay? And it would be that same spirit because guys, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. It's not people we wrestle against, but spiritual powers. It's that same Antichrist spirit that First John talks about and that Paul and Jesus talk about that will infiltrate the church, and cause people to, to lead people astray into doctrines of devils and away from Christ, okay? So understand that what I'm saying is that you must understand these parables in their direct context if you ever want to properly apply them elsewhere, okay? So yes, I do believe that there are going to be people who would identify as Christian who Matthew 7 will apply to in the judgment, on the judgment day that will go before the Lord, just like the unbelieving Jews who Jesus is referring to in the direct context, but they will go before the Lord with their religion, their outward displays of religion. Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I do that in your name? And they will hear from him, I never knew you, right? These people that are trying to clean the outside of the cup with their religion. But the direct context of that passage is referring to the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish elite, the barren fig tree, okay? When you come to understand that that's the direct context, then you can understand the spirit behind it and you can apply it 
to Christianity today. Because when you can identify the spirit in the unbelieving nation of Israel, you can identify the paper trail in religion today. Because again, we wrestle not against powers and principalities. Oh, excuse me, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, right? Um, and so it's an antichrist spirit that was behind the rejection of Christ and is still today infecting religion in the church abroad. So um, that's how you apply things today. Uh, so please don't take my words out of context. I hope this clears things up. All right, guys, I love you.